I never pictured a world where marijuana would be anywhere close to legal. And it's mind blowing to me that mushrooms are being decriminalized everywhere. Comedian Shane Moss tours the country discussing his psychedelic experiences. But I know that I'm hallucinating. I don't think that it's real. I'm not like, oh my God, the walls are bleeding. It's more like, oh my God, the walls are bleeding. All right. Reason caught up with him at the Psychedelic Science 2023 conference held in Denver this June, where he participated in a roast of the psychedelic scene. DMT is always like, oh man, if I would just would have pulled the thing out that it was telling me, if I just would have remembered the thing, oh, I could have saved the planet. Better smoke it again, I got a planet to save. The conference was sponsored by the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, and a reported 13,000 people gathered in the Mile High City to discuss every aspect of drug policy, research, and culture. Moss, who also hosts a science podcast called Here We Are, shared his thoughts about the mainstreaming of psychedelic drugs, the surprising pace of legalization efforts, and the role that Joe Rogan and other public figures play in normalizing psychedelics. We're in a psychedelic renaissance. A lot of people call it. It's certainly a psychedelic moment. Like, what what does the psychedelic renaissance mean to you? I don't know what the psychedelic renaissance means to me. I can tell you that as someone who was born in 1980 and experienced much of the Reagan era, just say no to drugs, and early 90s PSAs and the frying egg and this is your brain on drugs type stuff. I never pictured a world where marijuana would be anywhere close to legal. And, and it's mind blowing to me that mushrooms are being decriminalized everywhere. I started a yeah. science podcast, Here We Are, eight years ago. And at that time, the number of organizations even attempting to jump through all of the regulatory hoops to just test psychedelics in any way at all was there was just maps which was much smaller even just eight years ago doing it in a couple other small organizations and and now it's there's all sorts of johns hopkins and and stanford and a, a zillion universities are getting what, it. what do you think changed like why 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 now why are psychedelics suddenly everywhere that is a very good question i i think hmm Hmm. Why now? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know what changed. I, I don't know if this is just what progress looks like and it's inevitable. I, yeah. I, I don't know that that's the case. I have, I have no idea. I didn't see this coming. I, I think that maybe just the war on drugs was such horrible yeah. policy in the first place that it was never going to last. Hmm. So it's kind of like communism, right? <laughs> Eventually it runs out of something. Yeah, perhaps. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about public policy to yeah. speculate on. One of the things, I mean, you, you know, you're kind of a psychedelic comedian, right? Or you, yeah. I mean, you talk a lot about that. You have a show uh, which is built around your psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, what do you like about psychedelics? Uh Psychedelics just changed my life. I did them just as kind of a goof when I was a teenager, just to be a rebel or whatever, and uh, had smoked weed and laughed a bunch and thought it was great. But uh, psychedelics were something more meaningful for me. I always had pretty serious depression issues from the age of 10 years old, I would say. And they were something that really helped with that. Uh, when we say they, what, what kinds of psychedelics are you talking about? Uh, mushrooms were my all-time favorite, my go-to for a very, very long yeah. time. And then um, I think if it weren't for DMT, I probably wouldn't have a science podcast. I, I, I was always interested in how the mind worked. And then when I first smoked DMT, I became absolutely obsessed with trying to figure out what the heck was that. What was the, can you describe the experience that you had that you're like, I got to figure out what's going on here? 
Well, I've always been, I was raised in a strict religious uh, household. I didn't fit into that. I was always an atheist, especially in my younger years. I was a very angry, bitter atheist. I felt very bitter about my strict upbringing. And what kind of religion was it? Catholic. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. so you have the Holy Sacrament. I mean, you have LSD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that to have a DMT experience that that seems like you're talking with entities or in some other world or is this an afterlife or how do you explain is this some other dimension that is the subjective feeling of a lot of experiences it just made me go well how could i perceive something like that because i usually by the end of it i'd be like mm, i actually don't think i was in some other dimension i think it was in my brain so then the question is how would a brain make a perception that is so different than this conscious experience and it just got me really digging into how the subconscious mind works and neuroscience and it was incredibly impactful for me over and over again psychedelics have had it, it, I started doing ketamine years ago and um, and other other than uh, falling on ke on ketamine and scraping my face has been nothing but really interesting. Is falling and scraping your face on ketamine the new thinking you can fly on LSD? <laughs> I guess. I guess this looks much yeah. worse than it is. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm I'm a bit of a psycho, not of sorts. I I don't uh, I don't suppose to do like the the most reasonable. Um, uh, ways of doing psychedelics. And so, like, if anyone watches my documentary, Psychonautics or anything, they'll see it. I think I have kind of a balanced take on psychedelics. I, and and, um, I, and my, I have a lot of inherent disclaimers just in my own. You can look at this face yeah. and go like, well, maybe I should pause before doing ketamine outside of a nightclub so I don't fall over. Um, you know, psychedelics have become big enough where, um, I mean, you participated in a roast of the psychedelic community. What are, what are the parts of the psychedelic community that you like the most? Hmm. And then we'll get to what you find objectionable, about, but like what, what's great about not just the drugs, but the community that's building up around it. Yeah. I've, I've always liked the community. I actually, I did, I did psychedelics just alone pretty much for, a very long time until I started experimenting with doing a psychedelic show and I think 2015 was when I first started doing a few of those and I didn't I'd never been to Burning Man I had never been to any psychedelic festivals and so once I started meeting the people that would the type of people that would come out to a psychedelic comedy show one it wasn't the um, cliche burnout uh, you know dreadlock has uh, their only hygiene is sound bath type uh, you, you know these these ideas of you know Cheech and Chong or whatever the like this ridiculous idea of what what drugs are like it was never like that sure I'd sometimes have a, like one table of burnouts you know a bunch of cliches um, but you would just meet the most interesting intelligent people I had been doing science shows for years and it can be tough sledding sometimes, getting people to like have the attention span to listen to jokes about biology or whatever. And when I first, I remember the very first time that I did a show about psychedelics, the engagement was overwhelming. And afterwards, there was a line of people. I've been a successful comedian since 2004, and I've been on late night and everything else, and and. You'll go and do shows and just absolutely blow the roof off this place. And afterwards, a lot of times people will be like, hey, nice show, and leave. You do a psychedelic comedy show, and like there's a line of people that has a million questions, and they're meeting each other in line and connecting. And uh, the psychedelic community is just so inquisitive and so open. Um, and I, I would say like my criticism is sometimes the maybe a little too open-minded and a little what do you mean by that uh, may, maybe a little uh, uh i would like to see a little more critical thinking in in some of the aspects of yeah what are, what are the parts of the psychedelic community or you know kind of known psychedelic users that you 
find objectionable or annoying? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I can tell you as someone that, you know, I did 111 city psychedelic comedy tour ended in 2017. It was just the greatest tour of my life. I loved meeting people every show. I, I loved starting going to festivals and everything else. And then COVID happened. And um, as someone who interviews virologists and epidemiologists and, and things like that, the, the number of just insane, not just conspiracies, but absolute like anger and harassment that just anyone doing any kind of science is like a like kill the messenger. Granted, this is the internet and you're seeing the worst of worst cases, but it certainly opened my eyes to, um, I think, some of the um, problematic errors in thinking within the community, some of the magical thinking, a lot of the grifting in, uh, in the space. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of pretty dubious like supplements and things like that being peddled and treatments and cure all and telling people you can like cure their cancer with coffee enemas and stuff like that that seemed like a that's more of like a tea space. thing or kombucha, yeah yeah you guess, definitely really, you yeah. definitely need tea in your butt for to cure cancer not coffee you know there are a lot of or an increasing number of very public people who talk about their psychedelic use. Uh, Joe Rogan is one. Mm -hmm. Is he a purveyor of misinformation or uncritical thinking? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean I, I've mean, i been on Joe Rogan's show. I find him to be, you know, a good interviewer, a nice guy. And, you know, he's just... Alex Jones is one of his best friends. It's just his shtick. He's been into, you know, oh, did the aliens make the pyramids? He had, he had a show where he would, like, go and talk to Bigfoot hunters. And... It, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's a little discouraging someone who likes science when I watch like the Animal Planet and Finding Bigfoot is the most popular show or I try to watch the History Channel to learn something and Ancient Aliens is the most popular show on there. Um, and it is what it is, but I think that it's created a um, kind of, uh, you know, any show, if you're going to like get on late night, each late night person or Comedy Central or Netflix is looking for something different and um, and to get on Joe Rogan's show a way to get on there is to have like some big controversial idea or, or something like that and and um, yeah I, I think that he ends up kind of being subjected to just a lot of uh, grifters and just a lot of a lot of people that are Telling him what he already wants to hear and dressing it up in some sciencey sounding thing that is. Do you not think? Really... Do you think the psychedelic community is more open to kind of bad thinking or conspiracist thinking or anti science thinking? Uh, you know, than like the population at large or uh, the population at large. I don't know. I I find the psychedelic community to be very intelligent, um, but I I would say that you know. Because of the nature of it being such an underground thing, I, I think it's um, it has drawn people that are unconventional, that maybe don't like authority as much, and which is great. I mean, I think we should all absolutely be questioning science and authorities and laws and right. all all of the time. I I very much support that. Um, I I think that it um, it it sometimes. Like, as someone who can be too much of a contrarian themselves sometimes, it, it's just, it, sometimes it's like a, a race to see who can have, like, the most far-out idea. Because there's a lot of creative people in the space, and, and then also you want to, like, get attention for your ideas and advertise your ideas, and some of those, like, more far-out ideas are sexier and more tantalizing than... Um, you know, reality for some people. Not, I think reality is very interesting. Some people think reality is like very boring. And what about the, you know? So there's the you know the, there's the kind of um, psychedelic you know strangeness on the one side, or people yeah. buying any theory. Then there's also the, the like a whole subset of people who are like, I'm going to use these incredibly you know 
visionary, weird, whacked out drugs in order to become a better office worker. You know, you call them the optimizers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's your beef with the optimizers? I don't have a real, I don't have, listen, it, it, this is uh, the, the optimizers, the life hackers out there. I mean, I, I just find them um, a little funny and comical sometimes. I, I, I think some, some of the motivational stuff is probably just because my personal resistance and problems with self-care i'm probably just projecting a little bit like i don't want to hear that or whatever but i i think it's uh i it, it seems like there's a lot of commonality where where you where you are overly prescriptive within within these influencers in like the self-help community and it's very if you give people like very very odd and particular instructions then one that increases the placebo effect, but two, if if it doesn't work for them, you you're ending up you're putting the ownership on the user, and you go, well, you just must not have done the protocol correctly. Right? My there's not a problem with my protocol or my advice right. that I'm giving you as the user. Uh, you not... you did step three when you should have been doing step two or something. Exactly, you didn't cure your cancer with the coffee enema. You must not have done enough of them, or maybe you did too many of yeah. them, or you didn't do it for long enough, or you should have. You used use decaf instead. for some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, what uh, you know, I mean, you've done a bunch of different psychedelic themed shows, documentaries, you have a science show. What's the role of cultural production, for lack of a better term, in kind of making psychedelics normalized? Yeah, I mean, so like I said, it, it, I, I started comedy in 2004. I was like a typical late night, like, short joke absurdist comedian and i would i've always been interested in psychedelics so even back then i would i would sprinkle in a few psychedelic jokes here and there and i found that if i did a regular comedy club i could do five minutes of psychedelic jokes and it would be funny usually they were like goofy ones like i ate too many mushrooms and saw this weird thing you know and uh if i talked about them much more than that um, you would start getting funny looks, like, what's up with this guy? Why is he talking about drugs so much? And more and more, as this becomes just more of a part of the mainstream, as, um, as uh, I, I mean, I can tell you distinctly, my, my 111 city psychedelic comedy tour ended in May of 2017, and I had all of these deals potentially in the works and ran into all sorts of barriers with like Showtime and HBO not wanting to, they didn't have a problem talking about drugs. They had a problem talking about potential benefits and in, 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 in these talking about psychedelics as medicines. That was very taboo to them. They wouldn't touch it. And I think June 2017 is when Michael Pollan's book came out and was the first time there's a psychedelic book on the front of almost every bookstore right, in, the, yeah. in the country. They made it like, say, for NPR. I mean, like, he mainstreamed the discussion. And and so it was already, you know, yeah. making progress, yeah. for sure. I, I had seen that over 10 or 15 years. And there's, like, little things like that where there's a pop, and suddenly my mom has a Michael Pollan's book. And... <laughs> That's something I never have you saw. ever tripped with your mom? Oh no, that's I, I can't imagine that ever. I would. I certainly would. I, I'd have a better shot with my dad, maybe, but I don't I don't think that you know, it makes me sad. It's something that I think about sometimes when um uh, you know, I can be a reckless user yeah, of right. psychedelics sometimes. But but I have a lot of beautiful, meaningful experiences that I learn a lot from. And sometimes I think about people like, you know, I lost my grandma recently, that she never got to have an experience like that in her entire life, that my parents will probably never get to have an experience like that, that I won't get to have an experience with them because of all of the past propaganda and war on drugs and just how much of an impact that that had on, on culture. I mean, it, Nixon and a lot of the first criminalizing of, of drugs did start it's like it was very conspiratorial and it was very like machiavellian and everything else but 
But once it took effect, it didn't take any of that. It didn't, it was just a natural emergent, like there, it didn't, it no longer required people to like be plotting against, you know, civil rights groups or, or whatever else. It just, the enough people just bought into the propaganda that, um, uh, e even people that were open-minded ab about it, it was uh, never going to be on their radar to get rid of these laws. And so, uh, just so recently with, uh, you know, Michael Pollan's books and then opening the doors for others, for all of my criticisms of, of people like Aaron Rodgers or someone that might be peddling a bunch of anti-science nonsense, it's still um, to have some, like, huge... NFL Hall of Famer, um, you know, praising psychedelics, you know, there's pros and cons to it. And I don't, I don't expect, um, you know, NFL um, football players to like, you know, be the most scientifically in, informed and, and I, and nor, nor do I expect multi multi millionaires to be able to check their ego all the time. So what, um, you know, what, what do you think the benefits would be to society where psychedelic use or psychedelics are just normalized that that's a really interesting question because i'm not exactly one of those people that's like if you just put lsd in the drinking water and everyone did lsd like the world would be peace and love and i've, I've seen the negative effects of psychedelics i've been to a psych ward twice myself but i i know that psychedelics aren't aren't perfect and um and the very things that can help some people's mental health can hurt others. And, um, and I, I think that ultimately, um, although I have mixed feelings about just like making everything legal, um, the war on drugs is a horrible failure. I, I, I mean, I don't know what else there is to do, but just get rid of the absurd, um, laws around them and the, and you know it, it will make me nervous when people are doing psychedelics more and more willy-nilly because there's unexpected things like you know i marijuana changed my life i no longer like this stuff but absolutely just ugh, i had such a beautiful few few year run with marijuana it, it i loved it i never saw um marijuana being legalized. I was thrilled, even though it's no longer my cup of tea, thrilled to see it go so legal and get so popular and, and have uh, my grandma, I think did CBD before. Like, my God, I never saw that coming. And then, you know, sometimes you go, Oh, did people forget that also marijuana can make you like paranoid and stuff as yeah. well? And, and uh, you know, I wonder if, uh, you know, would Joe Rogan be as into peddling conspiracies and anti-vax propaganda if he didn't right. smoke weed all day and that was like his whole big shtick? Um, I don't know, <laughs> you, you know. What, um, what's it like, or how do you feel about you know, this? This conference seems to be part of the uh, process where a psychedelic um, culture, which is underground or a subculture or a counterculture is like moving above ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as somebody who's been in this space for a while, are you like, I liked LSD's early work, you know, before everybody knew about it? Or, I mean, how, what's it like to be part of a, of a, of a world, you know, a community, um, a movement that is moving from underground to above ground? I've I've been a big supporter of maps for years. I, I I've actually defended a lot of like criticism. You know, a lot of people are worried they've gone too corporate, and so I, I worry about that as well. I worry about any organization when they yeah. like get really big or whatever else. Um, I just love finding ways to legitimize the scientific process. I actually, it, if I were king, <laughs> or or if if I were just you know, a politician with a little bit of influence, say, I think that one very reasonable step would just to not make psychedelics a schedule one, just maybe make them a schedule two. Which means schedule one means it has no accepted uh, medical use and a high, uh, and it's highly potential addictive. for addiction. And the only thing that, uh, that making something a schedule one does effectively is it, it doesn't deter use in any way because no one's like, what schedule is this drug that I'm going to put in my mouth? Most people are just unfamiliar. Right. 
Um, and then it also doesn't necessarily influence the laws. So there's like no deterrent property if we're like, hey, don't do this or you're, you'll go to jail. Well, you'll get in more trouble for a Schedule II cocaine than you will a Schedule One marijuana that's, that's legal in most places. So the only thing that having it being a Schedule One really does is it makes it so incredibly difficult for, for scientists to just run basic studies like you'd test and anything else. I mean, we've made many black holes and particle accelerators. Uh, they used to think that if you did that, the universe would implode. And, uh, and it turns out it doesn't. Um, but you can test whether or not the universe will implode easier than you can test LSD on rats. And th I think that's, uh, that, that's going to create more harm if we, if we can't investigate. Um, these things. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not about being the cool kid hipster about psychedelics. I'm thrilled to see more and more scientific organizations um, getting to be a part of it. I, I have more pause about some of the influencer community out there and some of the wellness community that is, uh, I think a lot of it comes from a good place. Um, but I, I've seen some stuff that I'm like, ooh. What do you mean? I, you know, my mom growing up was always falling for every, you know, like door to door salesman pyramid scheme type stuff. So I was just so used to being exposed to these multi level pyramid scheme things and, you know, having Tupperware parties yeah. and getting, you know, this and that vitamin is going to do this and you got to get magnets in your shoes. And as my whole life, I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen, um, you know, why people like that stuff and, and, you know, take 40 different vitamins that don't do anything rather than getting actual exercise. And, um, and, and so there's just, there's a lot of things out there being sold to people that I'm like, ah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that life is about finding the placebo that works for you ultimately. Um, so, you know, it, it, I would say just make your own snake oil. It's gonna it's gonna be more effective if you go out there and you catch the snake yourself and research how to oil it. Every it's gonna increase the placebo effect, and you're gonna uh, your subconscious is gonna go. Well, I wouldn't have chased around a snake and oiled it for nothing. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be more likely to work. And and so there's just I'd say that there is a there's a fair amount of snake oil out there that that I think just overlaps with alternative thinking and more creative um, communities. And I think it's like, you know, we all kind of want to pretend we have magic powers or are going to be immortal or whatever. And I, I think that there's opportunities for people to take advantage of, of people's hope. If you project, you know, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years into the future where, you know, things have been psychedel psychedelicized, yeah. you know, what, what's, that, what's that world look like? Huh. You have a lot of good questions. What does a world look like 40 years from now where potentially psychedelics are continue to track and become like really normalized? I I think that to have for people to have more options even just to like escape reality or responsibility or whatever even even in the like more reckless use of things than just drinking their face off every day um you know i i think that i think that there is a correlation between uh, younger people aren't drinking as much and i think part of that has to do with marijuana and some of these other substances becoming more normalized that there is like lots more alternatives for people so i think even even the lowest bar of that of just like less drunk driving the less alcoholism and and i think that um i, I think that there will be a lot of excitement for a while and hopefully 40 years from now this will just be commonplace we'll be bored with these there'll be no use for a psychedelic comedy show because who cares? It's like, it, it, it's like, you know, marijuana based comedy is almost like kind of old and tacky by now. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's a sign of progress. I, I hope that five years from now, it'd be the hokiest, dumbest thing for me to still be doing a psychedelic show. I think that might be a little soon for it, but I'm hopeful that, that will be the case. I have other stuff I'd like to talk about. Uh, what's your favorite psychedelic? 
my favorite psychedelic. Oh my gosh, mushrooms are my all-time favorite. Absolute, uh, my go-to for for depression and for creativity. If I'm putting together a new act or something like that, I I have such wonderful epiphanies on psychedelics. I have such funny insights and meaningful takeaways. Um, um, ketamine is is the only psychedelic that I do like very willy nilly uh, because typically consequence free, but but it, it doesn't require the same like building up of so so I get to have like a very fun interesting experience without having to worry as much about the integration and like hyping myself up and nausea and um, DMT is the most interesting thing I've ever done in my life I've done, I've had a hundred DMT breakthroughs and it never got more boring. It got, it only got weirder. I stopped because it kept getting too interesting. Uh, and I did 5-MAO um, DMT recently, and it was like, that had to have been the most profound psychedelic experience that I've ever had. MDMA, if I'm in a relationship, and maybe we're talking through relationship problems in a loving and meaningful way. So context is very important. If I only get one for the rest of my life, it's mushrooms, but I'm gonna be so sad to say goodbye to those others. Shane Moss, thanks for talking. Thank you.